If anyone gets too warm or too cool, feel free to open a window. We don't want you getting too warm. Bad things happen when people get too warm sitting down. Start falling asleep. I'd hate to embarrass you, but uh, you never know. Sometimes you get caught up in preaching, you might embarrass somebody. <clears throat> so we're going to talk this morning about the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> and it's not going to be like people may expect, because I want to talk about the sovereignty of God and considering that in relation to me. Sovereign means supreme authority for self-governing. We have a sovereign nation. That means we are not under another nation. We are self-governing. Sovereignty does not mean that God does everything that is done on the planet. That is a ridiculous misdefinition of the word Amen. by people with PhDs and DDs and, and all kinds of letters behind their names, and yet they can't define a simple word of sovereign. Right. They talk about the sovereignty of God as though God is every player on the field <clears throat> playing chess with himself, and nobody has free will. God just predestined it all. That's a bunch of foolishness. Amen. And uh, But we're not going to go into how foolish that is today. Number one, God is the owner and creator of the universe. These are just simple facts of those who believe in God. And if you don't believe these things, then you've got to figure out your own way. Where you, where did you come from? Uh, a big bang? Well, that's a fool's escape. Yep. A big bang happened. It's like, oh, okay. Well, you're brilliant. Uh, God is the owner and creator of the universe. He's the king and judge of his creation, which is by his own right and privilege and obligation. God is just with no respect to persons. He judges in respect to truth and righteousness. His law is love in its purest form, which is perfect appropriateness. We are eternal souls who will either be blessed or cursed eternally according to God's holy laws. So, in light of this, I have a recipe for happiness. And there are four key ingredients, which you can see on the board here. And I'm sure everyone's wondering what Brother Mark is up to now. Uh, four key ingredients to a recipe for happiness, eternal happiness. And if you will apply these things in relationship to a sovereign, almighty God who will be not only your judge, who has been your redeemer, and who will be your judge, and who will be your Lord eternally, uh, I think you will see the appropriateness of this. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. verse 8. And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord took the man, verse 15, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Notice that God made the world, God made the garden, God made the man, God put the man in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Did Adam have a choice in any of this? Absolutely not. His sovereign Lord was his authority. He had no choice in the matter, and nor did he want one. He was smart. He knew that the best way to go would be to please his master, to do exactly what he was told, to dress and keep the garden. Because he understood at this time that that was the best for him, and God had his best interest at heart. Okay? Uh, Adam was God's property. Adam was not his own. The garden was God's property. Adam was God's subject, or slave, if you will, 
bond servant living on God's planet. Now, legally, Adam was not his own. He was God's. God gave him the death penalty for eating one tree, and He told him he could freely eat of the other tree. The tree of life was the tree of submission to God's sovereignty. It was life. It was letting God make the decisions. It was letting God choose what was good for me and what's bad for me. Letting God choose what's right for me and what's wrong for me. And realizing I am not my own. I have no business making those decisions in my own person. Okay? Most people don't get that. We live in America, okay? And we can we feel like we have a right to make our decisions for what we think is best for us, to pursue the American dream, to make sure that our rights are not violated. Well, you have some legal responsibilities there, but when it comes to God, you have no rights. That's right. You're not your own. You're His. By, by order of creation, you are His. You don't belong to yourself. You have no right making decisions contrary to His will. That, that's a, that is the death penalty. Okay? And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was basically Adam and Eve's step into deciding for themselves. <clears throat> And when they stepped into the path of deciding for themselves contrary to God, they did not gain knowledge of good and evil. They greatly lost their discernment. They greatly, uh, their, their discernment was traumatized. Their discernment was warped. Their discernment was not square and equal. Uh, because it was just Adam and Eve. And prior to that, the Bible says they were naked and unashamed. Well, it was still just Adam and Eve and animals. There was no reason to feel like they were in sin or to be ashamed or have, but they were their sense of discernment. Suddenly they took a, they took into their own hands what should have been God's right. and they didn't know what to do with it. They weren't prepared for it. And therefore, they've made a mess of it ever since. Mankind has. Chapter 3, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's the lie that men are following from that time. Yep. That I can decide for myself. I know what is best for me. I know what is best for my situation. And so they, they continually go off the path of God's law, go off the path of God's will. They continually take this into their own hands. Whenever they get frightened, you know, they say when a rabbit gets scared, it eats its babies. Well, that was really brilliant, wasn't it? But people aren't any smarter. Nope. As soon as we start to get scared, we take things into our own hands. Well, you're not, you're not any better equipped to deal with it than the rabbit is. Uh, Adam was not, never his own. <clears throat> Eve did not have a right to make that choice. She didn't even have a right to discuss it with the serpent. She was not her own. She was created to be Adam's helper and she wasn't doing her job. She had no business discussing these issues. Adam was the head of creation. If anybody was going to discuss these issues, she should have referred it to him. <clears throat> but she took it into her own hands. So, the first part of the, the recipe is what I call the happy tree. You want happiness? The happy tree, when you eat of the happy tree, that is you making a commitment to let God be God. You don't say, well, I'm going to do this because I like it. Because I think it's best for me. No. You say, what does God want? 
What does God want me to do? Where does God want me to go? What does God want me to say? What does God want me to read? What does God want me to listen to? How does God want me to dress? How does God want me to talk? How does God want me to visit? You have nothing to do with it. You're not your own. You have no business making those decisions. Well, you're not your own doubly if you're a Christian. By the right of creation, no man is his own. And that's why every man is under the wrath of God who has gone out from under his rightful sovereign. But you, as a Christian, if you've been redeemed, you're not only God's by the right of creation, you're God's by the right of redemption. Right. You were bought with the price of the blood of His own Son. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, a high price, mind you. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, your attitude, which are God's. Do you realize... And when the Bible says that which is not of faith is sin, it's talking about this issue. That which you cannot do believing this is what my sovereign wants me to do is sin. Because that which is not of faith means you don't have faith that God is wanting you to do this. Okay? That which you cannot do believing this is what my sovereign would have me to do. I am not my own. I'm a servant. I don't make these decisions. So when people in the world come up to you and say, yeah, you dress like that because your church tells you to, you can tell them, look, you're exactly right. I don't make those decisions on my own. You don't make those decisions? What, are you a puppet? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm God. He created me. He redeemed me. I'm not my own. I'm His. Amen. Well, don't you want to have fun? I, I, that's not for me to decide. Well, don't you want to have a good time? You're just going to spend your whole life. To, it's not for me to decide. You go back and look at situations in the Bible where someone was a slave. A lot of them we don't think about very keenly. What if you were a little Egyptian girl and you were bought by Abraham and Sarah? Hagar was a bondmaid. She had no life of her own. Her life was being a bondmaid. Her life was to aid Sarah and serve the family. When Sarah decided that she couldn't have children, Hagar, no choice in the matter, she said, I want to have children by Hagar. Hagar had nothing to say about it. You understand that? That's what a slave is. A slave has nothing to say about it. A slave is somebody else's property. When, when Hagar, when, when, uh, Hagar wasn't uh, acting properly because... You know, she was getting a little too high-minded. Sarah dealt hardly with her, and she ran, she fled. God came to her and said, go back and submit. Yep. Well, my, right, my rights were being violated. You have no rights, you're a slave. Amen. Go back and submit. When it came time that Ishmael was mocking Isaac, and uh, Sarah said, get rid of that bond woman. Her son will not be heir with my son. God said, She's spoken well, well, do what she said. He loaded her up and sent her away. Now, now she's on her own. But while she was a bond servant, she did not make her own decisions. It was not in her power to do so. She was not her own. That's what it means. She was not her own. I think we we've got too much of the spirit of independence and I can do what I please. Mm -hmm. That's right. The Bible says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. Well, what is it that's death? But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We're talking about the two trees here. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Oh, well, why is that? For it is not subject to the law of God. Okay? That means the carnal mind is the mind that thinks it is his own. Right. The carnal mind is the mind that thinks that I have a right to make this decision on my own. It's all about me, how I feel, what I like, what I want to 
to eat, when I don't want to eat, when I want to get up, when I'm going to go to bed, uh, whether I want to say yes, sir, or no, sir, or whether I don't want to say that, whether I want to cut corners, whether I want to sit up straight and listen in church or slouch, or whether I want to respect authority or disrespect authority, the carnal mind is the one that thinks it has the decision to make. Right. The spiritual mind is subject to the law of God. It, it doesn't have any decision to make. The decision is made for it. Understand that? The decision is made. It's not mine to make. That's what it means to be subject. Yeah. And so the carnal mind is enmity. Why? Because this is God's planet. And you have no business not being subject to His laws. You have no business running on your own wit. Yeah. Running on your own idea. Going your own way. You know, planning out your own path. That's not your decision to make. You're not your own. You are a slave with an owner and a creator and a redeemer. You have no say in the matter. You say, well, we, we do have a free will. That's right. You can eat of this tree or the other tree and you will reap the consequence. Right. Okay. Uh, Hagar had a free will too. She could just obey. <clears throat> But was that was that legally acceptable? I mean, was that recognized as a right? No. When slaves disobey, they got beat or killed. When the death penalty is upon eating the tree that God said don't eat thereof. The death penalty. Yep. You can be your own, or you can relinquish that and say, I am not my own. <laughs> You can say, I'm going to let God decide right and wrong for me. God's going to decide my future. God's going to decide whether I get married or stay single. God's going to decide whether I'm rich or poor. God's going to decide whether I'm sick or healthy. God's going to decide whether I have children or I'm barren. God's going to decide whether I have to labor hard or have a good job or what happens to me. It's not mine to decide. <coughs> well... There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Okay. That's the first part of the recipe. Okay? You gotta make sure you're eating from the right tree. When you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you are taking into your own hands that which is not yours. Because you are not your own. The next one is a seat or we could say a place in Luke 14 7 and he put forth the parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms saying unto them when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding sit not down in the highest room lest more a, a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him and he that bade thee in him come and say to thee give this man place and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room but when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, this is actually an application of this. Okay? A practical application. Because you can say, okay, I'm God's. I'm not my own. Oh, but there's some things, there's some outworking of that. There's some outworking of how that works in everyday life. And we're going to talk about that. Okay? We're going to talk about the happy seat. You want to be happy? This is my recipe for happy. you got to eat of the happy tree, and you got to sit in the happy seat. Beware of the scribe which desire to walk in long robes and love, greetings in the markets, and the highest seats in the synagogues, and chief rooms at feasts. Adam, had a, Adam Clark had a good uh, comment on this. When custom and law have regulated and settled places in public assemblies, a man who is obliged to attend may take that place which belongs to him without injury to himself or to others. When nothing of this nature is settled, the law of humility and the law of order are the only judges of what is proper. To take the highest place when it is not our due is public vanity. Obstinately to refuse it when offered is another instance of the same vice, though private and concealed. 
Humility takes as much care to avoid the ostentation of an affected refusal as the open seeking of a superior place. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace, favor, to the humble. <clears throat> Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another in the proper order before God, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace or favor to the humble. First of all, I must take the lowest seat in my own mind. Because if I go sit down in the lowest seat just so I can be worshipped, I'm still thinking about how wonderful I am, how glorious I am, how proud I am that I'm so humble. <laughs> I must lower, I must take this seat in my own mind. <clears throat> Honestly before the Lord, I must own my depravity, my unworthiness, my lack, the truth about me. Okay? Own it before God and realize that it's only by the grace of God that I'm not in hell. And my own estimation of myself and my worth, my value, and the value of my appetite, and the value of my desires, and the value of my happiness needs to all come down and sit in the happy seat. The lowest seat. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. You know what the lowest seat cures? When you sit in the low seat, it cures a lot of things that cause trouble. That's right. It cures a lot of problems that rob you of happiness. Okay? It cures you of being defensive, self-preserving, self-advancing, <coughs> self-glorifying, fretting, Bitter, holding a grudge, vengeful, envious, condescending. The things that repulse people from you. The things that you do that cause strife in your home. The Bible says only by pride cometh contention. That's right. Right? The low seat cures the fashion issues. When you take the low seat, you're not trying to advertise yourself. You're not trying to seek self-advancement through the fashions. That's what they are. Trying to be, you know, trying to go to church for what I look like. Make sure, you know, I'm not talking about looking clean and appropriate. I'm talking about, well, looking better or uh, gaining the applause of men. Being my own. Advancing myself. Immodesty. Worldly fads, carnal images, the cool dude, the macho image. It's all seeking the high seat. Yep. It's not seeking the low seat. <clears throat> the rich and fancy look. Not the humble seat. And by the way, <clears throat> like the guy that, that, uh, we, that we know, whose truck looks like it's just about to fall apart, whose boots look like they must be generations old, and a toe sticking out the end, and I mean... There's some people who are working at looking poor, working at this, and it's part of their pride issue. Right. Okay? We're talking about looking appropriate. Looking, we're talking about this tree applied. Okay? We're talking about what, is God, what does God want me to do for His kingdom? I'm an ambassador. I'm His servant. How can I be effective? What does He want me to do? Has nothing to do with me or my glory or what people think of me or how comfortable I am. It's what does God want in this body, this life. That's what it all boils down to. And so this seat is an appropriate application. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. You know what that means? That means a somewhat of a, a bashful, sober uh, uh, demeanor. Modestly appareled, not trying to stand out, not trying to be seen, actually <laughs> avoiding that. Actually, the shamefacedness means She's not bold. She's not trying to get attention. She's actually trying to avoid attention. That's what shamefaced means. 
Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now what would that be? What's the point of all that? The point is that I'm trying to advance and lift up myself. Well, aren't we supposed to have a positive self-image? <laughs> Actually, you're supposed to forget about your image. Amen. You're not supposed to have a negative self-image. Oh, woe's me. Or a positive self-image. You're supposed to forget yourself and get busy about your business. Yes. God's business. What God wants you to do. Okay? It's not about you. In Romans 12, go to, turn to Romans 12, and verse 9. Now remember, this is a recipe for happiness. Some people may think this is a recipe for the lack of happiness. But what you need to realize is there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. This is the way to true happiness, eternal happiness, happiness on earth, when you stop trying to run the race of self-advancement, self-glorification, self-preservation, you forget about yourself and you get busy doing God's business, that's where you find happiness. Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimulation or hypocrisy. Now, there's a number of applications here. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Okay, now, obviously the Bible is using the de definitions that God gives to these terms. Not what you think is evil, not what you think is good, but what God says is evil and what God says is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. you got to take the low seat to do that. Yep. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. you got to take the low seat to do that. You gotta kick yourself. You, you can't just you can't do your business in a way that accommodates your feelings. Right. Kick yourself in the pants, get out of bed, get busy, work hard, sweat, uh, work your way through, do what you're supposed to do, be productive. You're not your own. You're supposed to be laboring and occupying for somebody else. Yep. If you don't learn to please employers and please parents and and that sort of thing, do you really think you're pleasing God? Not expecting to be carried, but expecting to carry others. The Bible says, "Faithful he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. But the one that is faithful in least does so because he's not his own. The one that is faithful in least is not seeking the high seat. The one that is faithful in least is seeking the low seat. He's seeking faithfulness. He's seeking to please his master. He's seeking to be what his Lord wants him to be. Because those who are seeking the high seat, they're not faithful in the least, in the small things. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, or constant, or not giving up. People that are in the low seat are not complainers. They're not whiners and complainers. They're doing their duty and not expecting thanks or applause. They're just doing their duty. Someone who has a true servant understanding, a servant spirit, okay, who realizes I am not my own. I am his property. I am to do his business. It matters not what I think, feel, just like Jesus said, Okay, well, how many of you having a servant working out in the field, and when he comes in at, the, in, in at the end of the day, you say, sit down and I'll feed you. No, he said, no, you go, you go make ready that I may eat, and then you can eat. Right. He says, does he thank that servant because he did those things which were commanded him? No, he didn't thank him. That's his duty to do. And Jesus gave that parable trying and the, to the answer of Lord increase our faith. And he answered by saying, get in the low seat. Yep. You get in the low seat, that'll increase your faith. Your expectations are your problem. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> That's one of my biggest problems, my expectations. Verse uh, 13, dis distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. You can't do that in the high seat. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. You can't do that in the high seat. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. You can't do that in the high seat. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not 
high things. <coughs> Get down off your high horse, yes. as they used to say. Mind not, don't seek high society. Don't seek the highest room and the company of those in the highest room. And aren't we wonderful? <laughs> you know, we, we are the wonderful ones in the highest room. Get out of there. Get down to the low seat. And be content and happy to take the low seat. Okay? It cures a lot of things. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. What that means is get out of the high room, get down there in the low room. Be not wise in your own conceits. Okay, that's what he's saying. Be not wise in your own conceits. Quit getting high-minded. You need to take your self-evaluation down a number of notches as far as value and importance. Yes. What you think, your opinion, your taste, your outlook, bring it down. It doesn't mean anything. You're not your own. You're a servant. You're God's. And you know what? If you decide, I am going to be my own, all you are now is a criminal. Yep. You're an enmity. You're an enemy of God's kingdom and you will burn in hell. That's right. So what are you? You say, oh, Brother Mark, don't we have a choice in the matter? Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought we were supposed to have free will and choice. You do. Yep. You can go to heaven or you can go to hell. That's right. But you can't live on God's planet and be God's creation and breathe God's air and do as you please without hell. That's right. So what does that mean? It means I'm really not that important, am I? It's not about me, is it? I'm not my own. I have a maker. I have an owner. He has business. I'm to be about that business. Hey, Adam was put in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Okay? That's why you were put here. To dress and keep his garden. Not to do as you please and do whatever you want. You have a work. Now, the, the owner of the garden is a very loving, wise God. He's only going to tell you that which is best for you. He's only going to command that which is best for you. He's going to give you uh, that which is best for you. He's going to lead you in that which is best for you. But you don't, have the, you don't have the decision to make. He does. And when you, when you fail to give that to Him, when you take it to yourself, you're under the death penalty. Because you have no business doing that. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. <coughs> Live within your rank. And don't hate accountability. Expect it. If it is possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Okay? Lay down, I'm going to lay down my life to serve God's cause and not hinder it. If I take some buffeting along the way, we're not going to let that hinder God's work. I'm His servant, and me, me having a rough time is not the issue. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto the wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt he cold the fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Do you realize that true non-resistance is me in the low seat eating of the happy tree? Yep. Because true non-resistance means that I don't let people hinder my business for God. And if I get buffeted along the way, if they throw rocks at me, if they bite me on the one cheek, I'll turn the other cheek, but I'm not going to get out of rank. I'm not going to allow them to make me hinder the work of my Lord. Right. I am His. I'm on duty full time. Now, when, when they want to harm something under which my Lord has given me jurisdiction, for me to then... Say, oh, I, I, I don't believe in using force. That's not eating of this tree. That's taking the situation into my own hands. Right. That's me getting high-minded, elevating my piety, my righteousness above God's. God said to defend the weak. Right. According to God's law, I should defend my own life. I'm His servant. Okay? He doesn't want, he doesn't want to suffer loss. But to, to turn and get off track of what I'm supposed to be doing to fight with somebody is none of my business. 
but to allow them to damage his business is my business. Yes. You understand the difference? Yep. And people, the, the problem is, so many people want to make these decisions with their own brain. They don't realize they are not their own. They have no business deciding on just war or not just war. The Bible's already made the decision. That's right. They have no decision on, on saying, well, you know, we, we shouldn't use force at any time. The Bible already made that decision for That's you. That's right. Get out of, you're not in the decision-making room. Get out of there. God already made that decision. Okay. The happy man is the man content to eat of the tree of life and sit in the humble seat. Okay? Now, there's another part of the recipe. In Matthew 5, 41, it says, Who serves and compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Okay? The second mile. The second mile is the happy mile. The second mile is me not just doing what I'm commanded to do, but doing more when it's in my power. Going farther than the commandment. Going beyond the necessity. Yeah. Not just getting caught up, well, is this a salvation issue? Is this essential? Is it necessary? But, but if I am a true servant, really wanting to please my master, not only will I own him as my master, not only will I humble myself and, and be content to do his business, but I will do his business to the nth degree instead of minimum effort. Instead of seeking minimum effort, shortcut, <coughs> fire insurance and security, I'm going to believe that my master, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, I'm going to believe that he is, will be no man's debtor. The Bible says, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free, bond or free on earth. Ephesians 6, 8. In other words, believing that the one who knows best for me, and I have, I have no business making those decisions because he's smarter than I am by a long shot, the one who will exalt me in due time, it's not my business to do so. It's my business to take the humble seat and be about his business. He can exalt me when he wants to exalt me. The same one, if I go the extra mile, he's going to make me glad I did it. He's going to make me glad that I left this in His hands. He's going to make me glad that I let Him exalt me in His time. He's going to make me glad when I go the second mile. Because that's the kind of Lord and Master who is my Sovereign. Yep. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, so the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. <clears throat> the second mile is not setting my own boundaries, but letting God set my boundaries. Not cutting corners for my own pleasure and ease and comfort. Going beyond what the common people think is reasonable. Doing when you're not commanded to do. Doing right when others are not doing it. Going beyond what is expected of you. You know what that tells me when I see children doing that? Boy, it just warms my heart. Yes. When I said, hey, I want you guys to uh, make sure the kitchen's clean. And I come home, and the kitchen's clean, and the living room's clean, and the floors are waxed. It's like, wow. I didn't tell them to do that. But they did it because they wanted to go the extra mile. What does that say to me as a parent? It means you care. Yep. It means you're in this with me. That's it means right. we're together on this. It means you love me. It means you trusted that I would be happy and I would reward you. God is a parent. One place, Jesus was in his ministry. He said unto a man, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And what that means is, let me attend to my family duties until my father's buried and that's all taken care of. And then I'll come and do your business. Did Jesus say, well, that's a good idea? No. No, that, that showed that his loyalties were divided. Mm -hmm. He wasn't seeing it as big as it was. And that also meant that he, realized, he thought he was still his own. He's bargaining with God. Yeah. Negotiating with God. Do you ever negotiate with God? Does a slave negotiate with their master? 
Not on doing his will, they don't. You cannot find happiness unless you eat of the happy tree, you sit in the happy seat, you go the happy mile, and that all comes, turn to Matthew chapter 21, when you become the happy son or the happy person. And when he was coming to the temple, Matthew 21, 23, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. They determined their conclusions and doctrinal position by how it affected their position, their image, their happiness, their comfort, their agenda. And the problem is, they were so entrenched because of their peers, because of their friends, because of their image, because of their name, because of all these things, they were bound in this position. They were entrenched in a position and they could not break free. You can be that way, but you'll never be happy. That's right. If you want to be happy, you better be the happy son. Now let's read about him. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. Okay, when he said that, he had taken a position, an image. His friends heard him. Everybody knew it. Okay? Just like this Pharisee. They said, I will not. And they couldn't break free. But it says... But he repented and went. He came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Well, this in this situation, is talking about these religious leaders who claimed to go, but they went not. You know, you can, you can say, I will not, and you can be stuck there. And you can say, I go, sir, and then never go. Oh, yes, yeah, you can say, man, yeah, I'm going to do all that, and then never really do it. Because you never really relinquish ownership. Right. You're still hanging on to what I like and what I want and what I want to be and how I want people to view me. You're not giving that up. You still think you own your life. You still think that your future is yours. Well, while you're entrenched in that, you're doomed. Yep. Jesus said, Whither of the twain of them twain did the will of his father? They said unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. In other words, when you realized, maybe I took the wrong turn, you were so bound by your pride, you were so bound by your name, you were so bound by your image, you are so bound by the things you had said, you're so bound by what you liked or didn't like, so bound that you did not repent and enter in to your own salvation. When ye had seen it, ye repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. The happy son repented afterward. Yes. The happy son was willing to lose, to break free. To lose his friends. To lose his image. To lose his power and prestige. To lose his honor and his pride. Lose all the benefits of his position. Repented and went. Repented and did the will of his father. Reconsidered and said... My father has a right to tell me this. And he repented and went. 
Know ye not that the righteous, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. They repented and went. Yes. That's key. You cannot, you cannot find the happy way unless you are willing to repent and go. Right. To stop what you're doing. Stop what you've always known. <clears throat> stop what you're used to. Stop what your image is binding you to. And turn and say, I'm not my own. Take the humble seat. Go the extra mile. Stop taking it upon yourself to decide what you're going to do with your life. You're not your own. You've got to eat from the happy tree. Are you willing to eat that and not from the other tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is me decide. I, I think I can decide for myself. Mm -hmm. The happy tree is, I don't have a decision to make. God already made that decision. It's His. It's his. I'm not my own. I'm a slave. I'm His. I have, no, I have no say in the matter. I'm not my own. I belong to somebody, and his business is what I'm going to spend my life and breath doing, and I'm content with that. You know, I think a lot of people, they, they talk about, oh, we're the servants of God. But in the Bible, it talks that word is bond slave. Yep. Paul said, Paul... The bond slave of Jesus Christ. Oh, but I thought Jesus came to set us free. You think Jesus came to set you free to do as you please and be your own boss and make your own way? No. Jesus came to redeem you from the bond, being a bond slave of the devil, right. to be his bond slave. Okay? Yeah, you're free from that. And if you have any idea who your sovereign Lord is now, you'll realize I'm in the best possible position there is. Amen. Because I'm in the ship, but He's steering the wheel. The master of the universe is my driver. The master of the universe is the one making my decisions. He's my coach. He's my captain. He's my Lord. That's the best possible position you can be in. To say, oh, excuse me, I'm going to drive the ship now. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. You're a fool. But everybody, I mean, it's, it's so common for people, especially when they get scared. Give me that wheel. We're going to steer in the way that I think is best. What? What? No. Number one, you don't even have that position. Oh, I'm going to let God be in control of my life, except... No. What that means is I'm still in control. Right. The slave doesn't say, I'll serve you from 9 to 5. The slave doesn't say, hey, uh, you know, I'm on call anytime you want except from 2 to 4. A slave doesn't have that option. A slave is not his own. He's... <coughs> Somebody else's property. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. Naturally, the universe revolving around him. Mm -hmm. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man. Naturally, well, I, I can reserve some, you know, reserve that to myself. I can make those decisions. I'm, you know, I gotta live in this body, so I'm gonna make the, I'm gonna decide what I like. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is a wreck, yeah. is a crash, is judgment, is the due reward of your crimes. So, yeah, we've talked about the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty means that God is the supreme authority. 
He is he's the only one big enough, wise enough, strong enough to rule the universe. He created the universe. It's his property. He created you. You're his property. The sovereignty of God means that there is a happy way and that is let him decide right and wrong. Take the humble seat. Go the extra mile and be the happy son. The one that repented afterwards and went. Because then you are in the favor. You are in the favor of your sovereign. Right. God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. You are under the favor of the sovereign almighty God. The one who owns you twice. <clears throat> Let's stand together. As this message has been developing in my mind, there's so many things that I've seen and I thought the low seat would cure that. The happy tree would cure that. The extra mile would cure that. Often. The people who don't want to go the extra mile don't want to go the extra mile because, well, that's asking too much of me. Where'd that come from? That's unreasonable. According to who? When it's in your power to go the extra mile, when it's, when it's in your path and would please your sovereign, then for you to do that, there's joy at the end of that. You go the extra mile for someone, for God, for His glory, You'll never go the extra mile without having an extra bonus of joy. You'll never take the happy seat without feeling the happiness. And you'll never eat of the happy tree without experiencing the happiness. This is a recipe for happiness. In light of the sovereignty of Almighty God. Any thoughts before we go to prayer? You know, something that I've been thinking of lately. People want to be their own boss. They want to do their own thing. And sometimes people, in the way they care for others, treat them the way they would want to be treated. I don't want to push him. I don't want to pressure him. I don't want to you know, try and make him do things my way. But it is built into humans by God that you are happier when you are under pressure. You are happier when you are living to a standard that's bigger than you. You're happier when you're doing what you're told. It's a feeling of purpose, isn't it? Right. You know, I find children that are undisciplined are unhappy children. Right. But children that are guided, disciplined, corrected, and directed are happy children. Same idea. Yep. Yeah, there's boundaries, there's standards, there's joy in that, there's peace in that.